They were people, they were whistleblowers who actually came forward and pointed out to the fact that uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, while in France for over a decade, he had communication with, uh, with, with the United States, with, with the United Kingdom, with the CIA. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. James Corbett here coming to you on the 17th of June, 2016. And if you have been following the headlines, especially the headlines at CorbettReport.com, you'll note that there have been some new blockbuster documents recently declassified pertaining to the 1979 so-called Islamic Revolution in Iran. And the headline that I went with, another conspiracy confirmed... Khomeini had a secret channel with the U.S. detailing how Ayatollah Khomeini, who was, of course, in uh, exile in Paris at the time of the beginning of the 1979 revolution and the ouster of the Shah, was, in fact, already in contact with the Great Satan, uh, the U.S., and uh, had opened a diplomatic channel of sorts with uh, Jimmy Carter, in which he assured him that, uh, you will see, we are not in any particular animosity with the Americans— And also that the oil flow will continue after the establishment of the Islamic Republic. Some very interesting statements. Although I imagine that in my audience, there are several people who will look at that type of headline and just roll their eyes and say, well, what else is new? But maybe this is more important than that. It does have bearing on some pretty important geopolitical issues. So in order to get perspective on this issue, we're going to turn to someone with first-hand experience of the Islamic so-called revolution of Iran in 1979. We're going to turn to Sibel Edmonds, of course, the founder and editor of BoilingFrogsPost.com and Newsbud.com. Sibel, congratulations! $150,000, the first goal of the Newsbud.com campaign has been reached. Thank you for putting this together and congratulations on the milestone. Hello, James. Thank you. Uh, However, we have been warning everyone, we've been asking people not to prematurely congratulate us. I think it's exciting. We are so thankful to our supporters. However, uh, people who are familiar with fundraisings like Kickstarter, etc., they know that uh, last minute glitches happen, you know, for for one reason or another. Some people may realize that their credit card didn't have enough limit or or some people, uh, well, for whatever reason, during the last few days of campaigns, you know, if um, like like maybe some pseudo election shows that they put in there, some unexpected things happen and we have been told to hold off not congratulate each other, not to get comfortable. In fact, ask our supporters to continue pledging, to continue putting the word out, because, uh, and considering who we are, what we are trying to do, we need to keep an open mind that all sorts of things can happen. Uh, It's not becoming or being a conspiracy theorist, it's just being realistic. But still, we want to thank every single person, every single one of you who have supported us. Uh, and, and we want to say we are excited, we are enthusiastic, but it's not over yet. We have four and a half days to go and a lot of things can happen in four and a half days. So please don't quit. Let's not get this false sense of security. Let's celebrate and we're going to have a celebration party with all our team members. You're invited. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll celebrate it online with all of of you uh, after Tuesday, June 21st. Let's keep at it for four and a half more days. By the time this video comes out, four more days. Excellent. Well, don't count your chickens before they hatch. Don't count your funds before exactly. they come in. Um, so yes, uh, the funds will actually uh, come in on Tuesday. So if you haven't pledged yet, please do pledge to make sure that uh, Newsbud is over that hurdle. The link will, of course, be in the show notes. So let's get into today's conversation, as I say, talking about uh, the revolution in Iran in 1979 and this revelation, or at least the declassification of documents that have long been rumored to exist, uh, showing a secret channel of communication between Khomeini and Carter uh, before the revolution actually took place or as it was going on. Uh, Perhaps you, as someone who actually lived through that experience, can set the scene and the context for this uh, this information. Why why is this important? What does it tell us that we didn't know before, didn't have documentary proof about before? 
Absolutely. As always, uh, you emphasize the importance of historical context, and and we have to do that, Uh, especially in this case, because I was in Iran. My father was an activist. He participated in revolution in Iran. Uh, He actually took me with him to the marches, including the black, infamous Black Friday march. Uh, At the time, I was nine nine and a half years old. Uh, He was uh, working in the university. And uh, and, uh, a lot of uh, people within the academic environment, they became organizers of marches against the uh, monarchy, against Shah's regime. None of them, that the ones I knew, none of them were Islamists. However, there is this misconception conception, this wrong assumption, thanks to the U.S. media, thanks to the U.S. academia, thanks to the United States and the Western propaganda, that this revolution was brought about uh, by by the Islamists, by, by the extremists, religious fanatics, and then Boom, all of a sudden, o- overnight, they threw uh, out, you know, the regime, Shah regime, and they established Islamic regime. That is absolutely false. That revolution, that discontent was brewing for many years. In fact, we have to go back to 1950s when Mossadegh uh, nationalized oil and, and, and wanted to bring... Uh, uh, kind of a representative government in in in, in Iran, and uh, and and he he really really garnered a lot of uh, popular support, and so compared to what it was, Iran Iran was moving towards democratization. You know how we love to spread democracy, and in 1950s, that really set this very intense panic among uh, United States and other Western nations, especially a uh, United Kingdom. And they were like, we can't have democracy in Iran. Uh, this guy is going to nationalize oil. We have been sucking like leeches, like, like parasites. Uh, this is not acceptable. So they said, nope. No democracy for you, like the soup Nazi in Seinfeld episode, and and they basically uh, brought about this coup, this coup d'état in 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 coup d'état in in Iran, and and they installed Shah, uh, and of course Israel uh, and Zionists played a very 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 important role. So I would say the three main players in this were the United States, United Kingdom, and the the Zionist elements. So they said. We want Shah, we want monarchy. Shah came. He had this incredible coronation ceremonies. You know, he peed in diamond and gold toilet bowls, getting people's public's money. And of course, everything with oil was fine, the arrangement with the West. But the discontent uh, and people's, un, you know, the unrest continued and it kept building up. And there were several major movements in Iran. Uh, we had the uh, atheists uh, slash communists who were uh, after a model like the Soviet Union. We had moderate socialists. Socialists, you see many of these people, you saw them within the academic environments, you know. You had um, people who wanted to model after United States Constitution and have some sort of a representative system where the communists would be represented, multi-party system, and you had Islamists. And then you had these weirdos, I'm sorry, I have to call them weirdos, Mujahideen Khalq, M-E-K, and they were Islamic communists. I don't know how you can mix the two, but they, 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 they were a segment too, so they were going to have their representative government. So all these different factions, after years of competing with each other, never getting anywhere, they decided to put their differences aside. They said, let's get united. And let's get rid of Shah. You know why? Because after all, the major goal, all of us have this common goal, get rid of monarchy, right? Once we get rid of the monarchy, then we'll settle our differences. You know, that's very, that's easier said than done. And we have talked about that before. It's like, sure, you can revolt, you can throw out, but what's going to happen the morning after? That's the question. Who wants to become the major power? You know, it becomes always this power struggle among factions. Well, these factions, they put their differences to get, uh, aside and they got together. They, they had the marches, including that Black Friday march that my father took me to. They were students. They were communists. They were socialists. So they got rid of Shah 
And then the question became, now who was going to have the upper hand? And this was when the Islamists, uh, they, they had a little bit of majority. They went and they talked with those who were after representative governments and Mujahideen Khan, And they said, you know what? Let's get together and get rid of the Communist Party because they are godless. You know, they are atheists. They have no place in Iran. And they nodded. They said, sure, we, three, four of us, factions, can set up representative government. Overnight, they rounded up thousands of people. They, they beheaded them. They basically shot them to death. They put them in jail. And then uh, six months, nine months later, two, the, two of the other, you know, Islamists got together with another faction. They said, let's get rid of these guys now, you know, the process of elimination. And then they gained a monopoly. And they, uh, we had Ayatollah Khomeini coming there. And slowly, not overnight, we were first, women were asked to put loosely scarves. Then they said they had to cover all their hair. You know, that's systematic conditioning, one step at a time. You know, Department of Homeland Security, TSA pat down. Oh, the NSA thing comes out. And before you know, you are under this fascistic government. I know they are accusing Iran of that. I think we are basically the same boat, except we can have our hair exposed. So, I mean, that's such a, um, I know, valuable thing. <laughs> Other than our hair being exposed, we are basically on the same boat, people. So that, that's the story of what took place in Iran. It was not, well, after the Islamic regime gained control, these documents that are being exposed now, the facts in these documents, they surfaced several times in Iran. In 1981, in 1982, they were people, they were whistleblowers who actually came forward and pointed out to the fact that uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, while in France for over a decade, he had communication with uh, with with the United States, with with United Kingdom, with the CIA. The fact that another famous Ayatollah, Ayatollah Rafsanjani, who was in the United Kingdom in kind of an exile, he had millions and millions of dollars bank accounts in United Kingdom. His kids enjoyed going to the Western universities and they are anti-Western, right? And they started putting out information. However, um, the regime basically started either eliminating them by accusing them of being foreign agents, spreading rumors, or the newspaper and people, basically, the regime would point and say, these people are conspiracy theorists, you know? They are coming with all sorts of wild, crazy conspiracy. Aren't we calling United States the great Satan? And also another factor to keep in mind, James, is all the stuff with OPEC, that the OPEC crisis in 1970s, and when we discussed that movie, <laughs> um, we, that came up about the fact how much was taking place. There were, there were tons of things taking place in Libya, in Egypt, you know, with Israel becoming real, the, 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 the Israel today, and of course the... Uh, the OPEC crisis. So uh, that that's that's the main uh, macro trying to quickly say what was the situation. Now, as we know, they passed this law, I believe it was during Clinton administration, and they put this time limit on the classified documents. They said, we're going to give, I don't know, 40 years? Is that the 40 years or 30 years time limit? And after that, all these things within CIA, et cetera, should be declassified, right? It sounds great, doesn't it? It sounds wonderful. And again, a lot of people like to accept these kinds of uh, good sounding, nicely, nice sounding uh, notions at face value and say, yeah, transparency, sunshine. Well, First of all, you have to start thinking critically and say, first of all, you don't know how much is being classified, what is being classified. Think about a big chest and there are millions of documents, okay? And they are telling you that every 30 years or 40 years, they are declassifying these and as the time passes, the expiration date comes, they put it out there. How can you establish that, that that's happening? Number one, you don't know what's classified. Number two, you don't know how much, how many pages are classified. Number three, there is no oversight. The ones who are declassifying are the people who have classified it. These are the agencies with tremendous amount of stakes there. For example, a good example of 
this would be Operation Gladio. It has been established as a fact that we've been carrying out Operation Gladio. It started in 1950s after World War II, and then it grew from there. As you know, James, nothing really has been declassified on Operation Gladio, and that passes the expiration date by another 40, <laughs> 30 years. Now, same thing with this document. Now, they put out this information. They are saying, this is now declassified. The question now for me is, why are they putting this information out? Because think about it. The question is, had they not declassified it because of the expiration stamp, which one of us would have known that there was some documents there, the expiration date passed, and they didn't declassify, right? We don't know what is in there. So that boils down to the question of why. Why the CIA, why the United States government, why the deep state is declassifying this incredibly important uh, document? And I, I don't have any reason to doubt its authenticity because, as I said, we knew that the, the relationship was there, the communication lines were open, and we knew that the uh, United States, the Western countries, they were in this position that if they did not join forces with one of the main elements in Iran, they had this risk of losing Iran to the Soviet Union. You know, they share borders, Caspian Sea, you know, the whole oil basin there. Uh, so if they had to take side, the, the Westerns, and if they had these major stakes, who would have they sided with? Well, obviously, they didn't fall into the Soviet camp because you're looking at religious Islamists. And the Soviets didn't gain anything in this. So the question remains as well, it was beneficial to which two sides at the time during the bipolar world that we were living under. And, and then the question is, why are they declassifying this now? Because whoever decided to declassify this, the, the deep state, the powers, they know what this causes in Iran, okay? It may not be a big deal for a lot of people here in the United States. Oh, yes, yeah, they declassified, so somebody says this. But in Iran, as we speak, as we are recording this session, so much is going on with the age of Internet, Twitter. Everybody in Iran knows that these mullahs, ayatollahs who are calling the United States the great Satan, it was all for show. And, and it stinks, you know, they know that something is really awfully rotten in Iran. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so that for me, because for the past few years, I've been saying Syria, Yemen is in uh, Obama's watch. And the next administration is going to restart, rejuvenate that whole Iran issue within the domino, within the chessboard. Who else really is left that we haven't really gone inside? <laughs> you know, Syria, Yemen, Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan. Uh, well, it's Iran is the only one really left standing. And they strategically, I believe, kept that for the next administration. I mean, each administration gets two or three to juggle. And Obama had his hands full with his. And, and Iran is going to be for the next one. And the next one is coming, whether it's Trump, whether it's Hillary Clinton. And, what uh, you know. It, it, this would go a long way to rekindle, rejuvenate that uh, Arab Spring moment for the Iran Spring. You will see, every one of our viewers will see how this is going to come into play six months, nine months down the road, a year down the road with people revolting and showing that these people were not even who they said they were for the Islamic regime. And this is going to come up and resurface over and over again. And I want to quickly mention a quick information here, a quick piece of information. Um, 14, 15 years ago, through one of the legal firms uh, that I work with during my case, I, I got to know this investigator, PI, private part-time investigator, the firm had hired. Now, this man used to work for the CIA. He was an agent, and he spent years in Iran uh, during Shah's regime. And his cover, he told me, he introduced himself, said, yes. And he actually spoke Farsi, and I speak Farsi. I said, wow, how did you learn? He said, well, I lived in Iran. I worked for the State Department slash the agency. And his cover was the radio announcer for the English language uh, radio in Iran, broadcast from the embassy. <laughs> that's, that's one of the common uh, uh, covers there. And he said, you know, the hostage taking, that infamous scene that whenever they talk about Iran, U.S. mainstream media, 
guess what they always like to show? They like to show that, you know, these bearded men going there and taking over the U.S. embassy and they're taking these poor Americans as hostage barbarics, you know? I think that is the most famous scene that has been played billions of times by the U.S. media. Um, it's always pointed at by the U.S. media because of their masters wanting that scene being like this thing. You say Iran, the first thing people think, visualize is that hostage taking, those barbaric animals, you know? Well, he was there and he said five, six days before the hostage taking, we... State Department CIA special staff members were given a notice, cable, to immediately leave Iran and go to, and they gave us option, Greece, Turkey, Tunisia, etc. Have some vacation time, beach time, you know, and then don't come back to the United States until we got our next assignment for whatever country. So he said, I packed immediately. It was like immediate now. You're leaving Iran. All the embassy people who were connected to CIA, anybody high level, were given notice to immediately leave Iran five days before that hostage taking. So the only ones who were left there, they were some administrative people. None of them were really CIA. They got all the key staff and they got them out of the country. Okay, and they left those poor uh, patsies there to suffer, the, the, the administrative people. So that hostage taking incident would take place. Now, you and I would say, therefore, it was some sort of a prearranged incident. They got heads up that the regime and the and the rebels using rebels, they were going to take over the embassy. They were given timelines so that they could take the important staff, see the real bad guys, CIA people, out of the country, okay, and then leave a few poor Americans in there to to go through the staged event. So you are looking at false flag. You are looking at the staged event. So that's another key fact that that tells me the document they declassified is factual. The, the question that we must be asking is why, why now, what are they planning, what's the next move on this chessboard, and I would say, mark my word, you're going to be coming back to it over and over during the Iran Spring, Iran Spring is coming, people. Well, Sabelle, I think you've hit on every single point that I wanted to cover, <laughs> so I'm not sure there's much left for me to say, except for, um, first, let sure. me back up a couple of things that you're saying. Of course, this is being portrayed in the Iranian media as conspiracy theory, this is ridiculous, these are fabricated documents, the exact types of things you would expect. Um, for example, Iranian parliament speaker Ali Larajani came out and said those exact things. Oh, they're fabricated documents sure. designed to manipulate public opinion. Well, I think it is designed to manipulate public opinions, but I don't think it's sure. fabricated. But um, the, the uh, they, they also, in Iranian media, press TV, pointed to Gary Sick, who was uh, part of Carter's national security uh, team, and he described himself as the point man in the White House dealing with Iran. Uh, he wrote a blog post dismissing the recent BBC uh, uh, Persian service, or whatever they call themselves, reports uh, revealing these documents for the first time as uh, a tempest in a teapot. He said... Uh, pr pretty much what you said. He said, uh, "We've this is not new information. I've written about this. Others have written about it in greater context in the past. Here's a segment from my book where I talked about this decades ago. So uh, this is basically backing up what you're saying. This is not exactly new information, but the documents themselves are at, at, at any rate new. And so the question is, why now? And I think you touched on that very well. Um, uh, why now? It's to destabilize or, or to throw a, a spanner in the works in Iran and to try to um, delegitimize the and, ruling power. And powers. one other important thing here to mention, because uh, I know there are a lot of people, they say, because of his stand, and, and I appreciate that, Jimmy Carter's, when it comes to Israel and some of the comments he's made, but you know how people like to put people on pedestal and worship, and that same thing with Jimmy Carter, you know, Compare, relatively speaking, you know, was he much better than, let's say, Clinton? To a certain degree, he was. But same people, I would ask them to also remind themselves that he gave one of the most important historical roles to that despicable 
jerk Henry Kissinger. Because during during this whole stuff, everything was designed and implemented by Henry Kissinger. All the Iran visits with Shah before the revolution, right before when Shah was actually begging Kissinger and, and Carter administration to provide support. He knew he was falling and they basically, they shook their head. They didn't. In fact, when Shah was on exile, left, flee, you know, he flew the country he wanted to come to U.S. because that's where all his bank accounts were kept. And U.S. says, you can't land here. So his private planes kept going and getting refueled and trying to find a country for asylum and stay. So he was abandoned by his masters, the puppet masters who installed him. So you have to think about it and say, why would the U.S. do that? You know, with this if it's Islamic, if it were so bad, they didn't rescue their boy. They said, we're going to hang you out there to dry. What we, like what they got to do with, with any of these uh Right. Uh, they did that with Bhutto. You know, I mean, Bhutto went to United Kingdom, but that's what they did. But again, when people, they said Carter was the greatest and he's <laughs> all the stuff and everything. All I want them to do is like, yeah, same Jimmy Carter had had put this man in the top position in the United States government, Henry Kissinger. Right. The fox and, behind a lot of things that took place. And in who, was, so to and who was Carter's national security advisor? It was Bigner Brzezinski, <laughs> the, the left counterpart of Kissinger, who, of course, was the co-founder with David Rockefeller of the Trilateral Commission, which put Carter on the map politically. So but, you know, if you and I mention these facts, these facts, the fact that Kissinger and Brzezinski now suddenly we're going to be called we are Zionist supporters because Carter has been tough on the Zionists and Israel. And by by stating these facts, you and I become the shills, <laughs> of course. Uh, you never win against uh, people who want to call you a shill yeah. for whatever reason. But um, OK, so let's let's bring this back down to what I think should be our takeaway from this, and our, I mean, in the West, looking at this yes. story, which is clearly a type of directed declassification that is aimed at ma manipulating public opinion in Iran. I think we can agree on that. But the question is, how should we view this and in what context? And I think the intended effect is for us to go, oh, look at Khomeini. Uh, oh, yes, of course, he was doing back channel dealings and trying to wheel and deal to get into Iran. But Really, the flip side of this is, well, the U.S., I mean, why was Khomeini in contact with America about what was going on in Iran? It's because everyone knew that the Americans really controlled the Iranian military at that time. And the wh whoever America supported was going to be able to affect the transition in power that was taking place, that was already taking place. So the real implication of this is, yes... America was in control of Iran in a in a really technical military sense at that time and they used that influence to to create what became the Islamic the Islamic revolution. So what is the implication it's that America continues to have influence and continues to direct and influence events um, that that go on there and I think that's the way that the American audience and western audience should be looking at this story is that the flip side of this is the Americans were dealing with Khomeini and the, it it shows time and time again these things are manipulated from behind the scenes any final thoughts on this before we wrap up the conversation No I think uh first of all my hats off to you because I saw this and I started going and looking online to see how many news channels are covering this or even talking about it. And I saw that there was none. So even that is by design. They put this out for their target being in Iran. They didn't want to make too much maybe noise here with it. A couple of alternative media outlets, they actually pointed out to the fact that it was released, but that was it. No analysis. You would think this would be on CNN, NBC. Oh my God, this is big, right? And then, lo and behold, I, 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 I come to your site and you have written about it. So uh, it tells me that, you know, we, we are on the right track <laughs> with all the people that we follow. For example, I do follow your website. I'm following all your YouTube channels. It's like, yeah, I mean, other than you, I believe maybe Blacklisted and Intel News, nobody else even mentioned it. And, and that itself, I think, is very interesting because you know how things happen. This, something like this comes up. If they want this to become you know, known, it will be on every channel, 24 by 7. They would be interviewing Shah's son, for example, getting comments from him. No. And that tells us, that tells me that the intended audience 
for this particular strategic release, the classification is Middle East. Specifically, it is the Iranian audience and it is going towards the Iranian spring. Just watch until that Twitter stuff pop up. Uh, I wish I could disagree with that analysis, but I can't. So let's wrap up the conversation at that point. But speaking of work that people follow, newsbud.com. Uh, once again, congratulations. Once again, an exhortation to the people out there. Please um, continue. If you have not pledged yet, please do pledge. Make sure that Newsbud is comfortably over that goal so that when it comes on Tuesday, it will 100%. The first stage will be funded. It will be completed. And when that happens... What can we expect coming out of Newsbud in the coming months? Well, uh, we gonna be we gonna be very busy with our production and everything. Uh, one of our producers, Spiro Skouris, moved uh, from from Seattle to Oregon to Bend. We are gonna be getting our first IMAX, so we can put our Adobe and get our Adobe. I mean, all these resources that people think, oh yeah, we have. We don't have a lot of those things. So we're gonna set up that so we can up our video productions, daily video productions. Same thing with what Peter B. Collins has been doing. Uh, some investigative journalism work um, topics that I have had on my list for a while, and those are going to be pursued. So uh, we have been putting some samples of, you know, what we, what we do, what kind of things we will be doing. But this is going to be like get down to, of course, it takes about three weeks to receive the funds from Kickstarter. So the date ends June 21st. It will be around July 10th before that that fund is transferred to our organization so we can spend it and put some of these resources in place, have a little bit of travel budget. You and I are going to start talking about your documentary project. I haven't forgotten. And we, we love that idea. We want to support it. Uh, so we have a lot of good plans. It's just four days left. We want people to just maintain their 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 vigilance and uh and then after that let's celebrate all together jointly and again thank you for this opportunity and for this discussion session because as as we just talked about it nobody else has been really covering it delving into it even though as you can tell the topic is big it's really major and i i hope we will see more people challenging what they're trying to maintain here in the u.s and start talking about it i don't care how they want to talk about it but but pay attention and then have your antennas up. So when you see things happening, you don't assume that things are ha happening just out of the blue, just by themselves. No, these things lead to other things and the other things lead to other things, all chain events and chain reactions. And this, uh, this is a major element in what we're going to be seeing with Iran. So thank you for the, for the opportunity, James. Well, thank you for taking the time. And I should note that in the show notes for this interview, I will put not only um, my article on this, but also uh, links to a couple of your Probable Cause podcasts where you talked about your own experience in the Iranian Revolution and uh, other related materials, as well as, of course, a link to uh, your Boiling Frogs Post YouTube channel where the recent Newsbud reports have been popping up. So if people want to take a look at what, what they can expect in the coming months. That would be a good place to go. We'll leave it there. Sabelle Edmonds, thank you again for your time. Thank you, James.